Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When my husband and I watch TV dramas together, they tend to be mysteries or crime shows or legal shows. And in the course of those shows, there is something that characters inevitably say in nearly every episode. I promise. I'll get to the bottom of this. I promise. I'll never hurt you. I promise. We'll catch your husband's killer. I promise. It drives me crazy when I hear that because they're almost always making promises they can't keep. And besides, it kind of sounds silly. In most cases, there's absolutely no reason for the character to make a promise to the person that they're talking to. Do you go around saying, I'll put my cart back in the cart corral? I promise. <laughs> I'll never be late again. I promise. I'll put the toilet seat down next time. I promise. <laughs> no, we don't do that. We don't go around making promises willy-nilly. We usually reserve promises for more serious things, things that mean something, things that we have control over. You can't promise that you'll never hurt somebody. You can promise that you'll try not to hurt them. So when I hear characters on TV promising this and promising that, I think, yeah, right. And I mumble, promises, promises. And that makes me sound pretty cynical, I know. But maybe you can relate that when you've had a, several dozen trips around the sun, you learn that some people do what they say they're going to do, and some people don't. Some people do stuff without having to make promises, and others make promises that they don't keep. You learn that sometimes the word promise is a positive, reassuring word, and sometimes promises are empty, prompting the cynical grumble. Promises, promises. <clears throat> when I read the gospel that you just heard, I wondered if Jesus ever had moments of cynicism like I have. Did Jesus ever hear people say that they were going to do something and think, promises, promises? In this passage, Jesus and his disciples go for an after-dinner walk out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus kind of casually mentions that they're all going to desert him. Before he could even blink, Peter blurred out, Even if everybody else abandons you, I won't. And Jesus says, But Peter, this very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And what does Peter do? He promises that he will never deny Jesus. In fact, he'd be more likely to die with him than to deny him. And the other disciples jump right on that bandwagon. Me too, same here, Jesus. We'll be there for you. We promise. But I wonder, did Jesus believe their promises? Or did he mumble to himself, promises, promises? And a little while later, Jesus took Peter and James and John, the closest, most committed disciples with him. Jesus was distressed and grieved about what was to come. So he brought the three of them to the Garden of Gethsemane to sit with him, to comfort him, to pray with him during his time of fear and anxiety. Jesus made it very clear what he needed, saying, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. It's a reasonable request, right? Very clear expectations. And the disciples nodded their agree agreement, of course we can do that. This was the perfect opportunity to prove their commitment to Jesus, to show their faithfulness to him, to live out their promise to Jesus by being there for him in his time of need. It was clear how upset Jesus was when he threw himself on the ground and began to pray. But Jesus had barely spoken the word Abba before he heard, <laughs> Okay, so... After a big meal like the Passover, I understand a quick nap. But even after Jesus woke them up, very clearly distressed that they were sleeping, these three disciples fell asleep two more times, leaving Jesus to pray and plead and struggle alone. 
We'll never abandon you. We promise, still echoing in their ears. Promises, promises. And struggling alone would be the theme for the rest of the night for Jesus. As Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss, as Jesus was hauled away by guards, as he was beaten and mocked, as he was questioned and accused in front of multiple groups of authorities, and only hours after Peter had promised that he would never deny knowing Jesus, and in the very same chapter of Mark, Peter would swear he would promise that he didn't know the man that they were talking to him about. Not just denying Jesus once, but three times before the rooster crowed twice. That rooster reminded Peter of his broken promises. And the other disciples were no better, though they had all promised to be by Jesus' side, promising that they'd rather die than run away. Their promises turned to promises, promises, as they ran away and hid. This passage, the whole story of Jesus' passion, even the whole gospel, none of them instill any hope in human promises. But there's one promise that is made and kept in this passage. Earlier in the passage, Jesus and his disciples were sitting around a table, eating a dinner that their ancestors had eaten together for 1,300 plus years to celebrate that when their God had made promises, God kept those promises. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, God had promised that he would bring them to freedom. And God had promised their ancestors that he would give them a land of their own. But God kept those promises. God freed them from slavery through the Red Sea. God gave them the promised land after 40 years of their wandering in the wilderness. So every year after that, God's people shared that Passover meal again, eating roasted lamb, bitter herbs, unleavened bread, to celebrate their God of kept promises. They drank wine to remind one another of God's love and God's faithfulness through the best and the worst of times. And it was during that meal of kept promises that Jesus broke bread and raised up a cup of wine to make another promise, a covenant promise like God had made to Abraham and to Moses and to all of his people. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant, shed for you to forgive your sins. In those words, Jesus made a promise to give his body and his blood for the forgiveness of all. And Jesus kept that promise, dying just a day later, dying for us, giving his body and blood for our salvation. Jesus knew that we humans aren't perfect. We make promises that we can't keep. We often break our promises. We struggle to turn our words of promise into actions. And that's exactly why Jesus came, to live out God's promises, not just in his words, but in his actions. Jesus came to be God's promise of love in the flesh. Jesus came to prove that in a world filled with promises, promises kind of moments, we have a God who keeps his promises no matter what. Tonight we will gather here to once again receive God's promises, to eat and to drink Jesus' covenant with us, to be reminded that God's promises to us are for forgiveness, for love, for life, and those promises are forever, and those promises are for you. Amen. I invite you to rise as we sing together.